Well, today we are going to be talking about threats against homeschooling. And I don't know of anyone better qualified to speak to that issue than Mike Donnelly. He is general counsel of HSLDA, Homeschool Legal Defense Association. He's also the director of their international outreach. Mike, it is a privilege and an honor to have you on the show today. Well, Israel, as usual, we see each other in strange places, either <laughs> internationally or over the internet. So I yes. look forward to seeing you in person uh, again soon. Yes, for sure. <laughs> well, today is an interesting day because we had set up to talk about a summit that's going to be taking place at Harvard in June. And this is a summit where a bunch of higher education professionals, professors, and people who work in academia were going to be meeting at an invite-only gathering to discuss either uh, a presumptive ban on homeschooling or, at the very least, uh, severe regulation of homeschooling across the country. And then last night, we got notice that uh, this event may be canceled. Um, and so the actual physical event may not take place at least at this time. But uh, let me ask you, Mike, first of all, on the canceling or closing of the event, uh, which, which has been reported, but I don't know that, you know, how official that is. I, I think it's pretty official at this point. Uh, but did they give a reason why they're canceling the event or is that sort of open to speculation at this point? All right, Israel, you're talking about the Harvard Summit, uh, which HSLDA wrote about back in March, and we've been following. Uh, it's organized by Jim Dwyer from uh, a college in Virginia and Elizabeth Bartholet, who is a Harvard law professor and the director of their child advocacy program. The summit was supposed to take place in June, um, and it was, as you said, by invite only. They were only inviting uh, a narrow set of people who agreed with their particular point of view about the fact that there should be more regulation on homeschooling. Um, in an email that we saw uh, that was sent to us from a reporter, I have no idea where the reporter got it, uh, but we did see the email which was from Elizabeth Bartholet to the participants of uh, this particular conference saying that they were canceling it uh, because of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and, and as it turns out, uh, the email was dated April 3rd. So they had canceled it saying they were gonna look to reschedule it next year in June. And uh, so it's been some time that it's been off the books. Um, but uh, anyway, we'll be watching very closely to see if they do reschedule it. I don't know if they'll publicize it quite as much, given the avalanche of criticism that both Professor Bartholet and this conference have received. Okay, now we want to be careful that we don't speculate too much on motive and some of those things, because some things perhaps they haven't spoken to very directly. But I saw a comment on Facebook where someone said, oh, well, that's great that they've canceled. Maybe they've had a change of mind. <laughs> so do, do we have any plausible reason to believe that this group of individuals has had a, a change of heart and mind and that now they're going to be advocating for homeschooling because they, they've, they've seen the error of their ways? <laughs> no, we have every reason to believe that they haven't changed their mind. Um, we have we have a Harvard Crimson interview with Professor Bartholet, which was just like, I think last week, where she pretty much reiterated um, her views. She didn't back away from them, although she did say that um, some people were mischaracterizing her views. She you know, was reacting to, apparently she's getting some emails from people who are not happy about uh, what she's proposing. Um, and she says, well, I'm not a Nazi. I'm not, you know, part of the KKK. And um, I think she may have been pointing to some criticism that I made about her piece, about her piece, not about her. Uh, I never, ever said that she was a member of the KKK or a Nazi. What I did in my response article, which is published on Medium, what I, what I said was her proposal, which is a presumptive ban on home education, uh, it, and and her um, her her praise for the German approach to homeschooling. I I explained where the German view on homeschooling came from, and also that her idea of a presumptive ban 
has been is based on or at least is similar to methods of control of education that were used by not by the national socialists in germany hitler in 1938 engineered a takeover of the education system in germany so that all schools would have to promote not national socialist nazi nazi values okay and you couldn't privately educate your kids or or if you didn't send your kids to school they would prosecute you for crime um so that was you know and i didn't say she was a nazi i just said this is what the nazis did um likewise with the kkk uh in 19 in the 19 early 1920s in oregon the kkk and others who were motivated by anti-catholic animus um they spearheaded and were successful in passing a initiative a voter referendum type um law that would ban private education okay and that that law was reviewed by the supreme court of the united states in a case called pierce v society of sisters uh and that and in that case which is a very famous case for you know for us and for people who think parental rights are fundamental rights um especially in education uh the supreme court in that case said that uh basically the fundamental right of parents um trumps you know any state interest in education and requiring children to receive instruction in education only from public teachers and that the state did not have the authority to require children to receive instruction only from public school teachers because they said and that a, a student is not a mirror of the state you got it that's the famous quote you know the child the child is not the mere creature of the state and and so i i wrote those things um basically pointing out that uh you know hey these ideas have been tried in the past they've been tried by people who want to control education in order to promote a particular set of values that's what the kkk was motivated by that's what the nazis were motivated by but in my in my article i said specifically i said i do not I am not trying to suggest that Professor Bartholet is linked to or supports uh the Nazis or the KKK. In fact, I said I am certain that she does not and would denounce them. I said, but her recommended method of dealing with homeschooling um is too similar to these methods to escape comparison. And uh and I stand by what I wrote. And so anyway so she she wrote about she kind of responded to that in the Harvard Crimson article uh which was an interview of her and you know exploring this whole um issue which is promote you know which is provoked an absolute avalanche tsunami firestorm whatever descriptor you want to use of public commentary on her views this conference uh and and critics of of homeschooling I think some people may wonder if the event has been canceled why are we discussing it? I'll give you my personal take on that. I think maybe I'm now I'm very interested better, in hearing what you think. Yeah, I th I think maybe now is a better time to talk about it and I'll tell you why because I think sometimes um if an event like this is canceled people go, "Okay, the threat is over. Uh there there is no looming issue that's still on the table. We can all go back to our normal lives and just assume that this died somewhere." but the individuals who are part of this event uh have been advocating for these types of ideologies long before this event and we have every reason to believe they will continue to advocate for these ideas in the future maybe in a different way maybe in a less publicized way um but but if uh, if you could speak to it for a minute um some of these issues go back a little further than this or or have a context outside of just the Harvard summit Elizabeth Bartholet had written an article that was published in the Arizona Law Review where she was sort of stating her views on home education and and reasons why she believes that some sort of action needs to be taken uh particularly by lawmakers uh related to home education. Can you speak to that? What are some of the things that she's raising as being oh, yeah. concerns? So so right I mean we were aware of her law review article for months there have been drafts of it up out there for for months uh, at least 3 months I think um 
and uh, uh, this this law review article is is worth reading. It's it's the most extreme criticism of homeschooling in a long time. Well, I, maybe I shouldn't say in a long time because Jim Dwyer wrote a whole book uh, critical of homeschooling in which he says that uh, you know parents are only parents because the state uh, endows them with parentage, which is a crazy thing to say. But he said it, and it, he's written a book about the whole thing, very critical of of homeschooling. Uh, but in but in her 80 page law review article, Professor Bartholay calls for what she calls a presumptive ban on home education, which is basically saying nobody can homeschool unless they can justify it to the satisfaction of the government officials given responsibility for determining whether or not um, they have met the justification, which they would also be in charge of setting up standards for determining whether the parents have met the burden for justification. And of course, you know, how many home parents would be given permission to homeschool if that was the case? I mean, you can look at Sweden. Sweden has exactly this same setup uh, where it doesn't use the words presumptive ban, but it says homeschooling is only allowed under extraordinary circumstances. It's the same thing. No one's allowed to homeschool in Sweden. Same kind of, of, of regime there. Um, and you know, Professor Bartholay, Israel, um, and you mentioned lawmakers. She, she, she goes beyond that. She, she realizes that lawmakers, well, I guess it depends on what you mean by lawmakers. We, you and I would probably agree that when we say lawmakers, we mean elected state legislators or congressmen, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you wonder if that's, you know, when you look at what courts are doing today, you you have to kind of put courts and judges into the, uh, <laughs> into the definition of lawmakers, which should <laughs> not be the case, right? Okay, and she, she recognizes that lawmakers, as we would understand them, legislators, are not going to do what she wants done. Um, and, and why? Well, I mean, she says the homeschooling lobby is powerful. Uh, and she points at HSLDA specifically. She says the HSLDA's aggressive lobbying tactics, uh, you know, are powerful uh, and they're organized and uh, lawmakers are afraid of them. And so we can't go to the legislatures because the legislatures are too afraid of these, you know, these torch bearing pitchfork wielding homeschoolers uh, to, to do what she wants them to do. And she, she, so she says the solution is we got to go to the courts. We got to go to these other lawmakers, the judges, because, because, because the judges might be willing to give us what we want. Uh, and we'll have to do it in, you know, 50 states, but at least we can go to the courts and we can say, hey, courts. You got to do something here. There are these kids who are being homeschooled, and you know their parents are too ignorant and are too religious to give them a good education that makes them into good democratic citizens. This is the language she uses, uh, and so you've got to stop this. And so you have to say that the constitution of your state or the rights of the children in your state are is is um, you know more important. And you have to believe what I'm saying, which is that all homeschoolers are these you know, right-wing, conservative, Christian, bigoted, whatever, uh, people who are too dangerous uh, to be trusted with the education of their children. And so you have to rule, because the legislators won't, that homeschooling should be banned, presumptively. That's, that's her solution. And, uh, you know, you pointed out it's not the first time, uh, but she is, she has come up with a policy prescription and a strategy, a public policy strategy to carry out her proposal. Um, and no other critic like her in academia has really done that before. I mean, you can go back to Robert Reich in the early 2000s and Robin West and Martha Albertson Feynman and Kimberly Urocco, um, Jim Dwyer, Mar um, Melissa Harris Perry, you know, other people who have been extremely critical of home education, um, they haven't really kind of articulated, hey, we need to get our act together. We need to be like those guys who have been so successful. And here's our policy prescription. Here's how to carry it out. So since these are academics that are gathering together in a type of think tank, and they're promoting these sort of, uh, these ideas within that academic elite structure, is it plausible that 
it's either already happened or that in the near future it could happen that these law students who are attending schools like Columbia University and Harvard and, and the schools that are being represented uh, by members at this summit, that these law students are gonna grow up with this as a legal philosophy, that the prescriptions that are being uh, directed in this Arizona Law Review and so forth are going to sound very natural to them and that the future judges or, or maybe even the present judges have already been uh, em embraced this. And do we have any examples of judges or, or courts that are already you know, representing this kind of ideology that you know, children have a fundamental right to a statist education and that parents should be distrusted and so forth? Well, that's the purpose that professors teach um, in part to, you know, I mean, look, look, it's Harvard's an elite institution and um, they set the, the path for a lot of law schools. You know, when, when, when law schools got rid of constitutional law as a requirement or in the first semester or what have you, Harvard led the way. Um, and, you know, they replaced it with international law. Um, so what happens at Harvard matters because other law schools look at what they're doing and it's, and, and the law students in Harvard, I mean, how many of them are on the, how many Supreme Court justices went to Harvard or Yale? All of them. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and how many federal judges went to Harvard or Yale? Many of them. So it's an extremely influential school and, and, and what teachers teach there makes a difference. Now, there are lots of students there who are with us and think this is crazy. In fact, I was on a, um, um, uh, uh, a panel, a Zoom panel on last Friday, uh, May 1st, uh, organized by Ideological Diversity, which is a student group at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government called the Disinformation Campaign uh, Against Homeschooling. And it was set up specifically because this particular student who was the head of this group was concerned about Harvard's being perceived as being ideologically opposed to homeschooling because this particular guy thought homeschooling was fine. And uh, anyway, so, um, but, uh, but anyway, that's the purpose that, uh, or that's one of the outcomes of, of teaching at these elite, you know, Ivy League schools is they influence students and writing law review articles also is intended to influence judges, law clerks, um, attorneys to give them ideas for litigation to advance their public policy goals. So that's what Elizabeth Barthelay did, and that's what she's trying to do. Um, and you ask the question, you know, is there any examples of judges who have done this? And funny thing, in your state of Michigan, where you live, um, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in a case regarding the Detroit public schools ruled that children have a fundamental right to a basic education under the U.S. Constitution. This has never been articulated before. Uh, the Supreme Court has uniformly said there is no federal right to an education. All the states have said that they interpret their constitutions to have some kind of right to access of education. But there is no sort of fundamental right to a particular kind of education. And this one particular judge, uh, Judge Clay in the Sixth Circuit, um, and this was a three-judge panel, it was a two-to-one decision in a case called um, Gary B.V. Whitmer coming out of Detroit. The judge said, well, hang on. We think that the federal constitution does have a right to education in it. They, they, they looked really hard, got their magnifying glass out, and looked at the constitution, and somewhere in there, they saw the word education. I've looked at the Constitution many times. The word education is not in the U.S. Constitution. Federal government does not have any authority over education, even though they have taken authority. And it's interesting to discuss how that's happened. I'd be happy to talk about that. But, but yeah, so you've got this federal judge, Judge Clay, in the Sixth Circuit saying federal right to education. So what does that mean for us as homeschoolers? I mean, look, we don't, you know. There, there are lots of reasons why we don't want the federal government to be in charge of too many things because we don't want to have a national approach to everything. We shouldn't. The, the Constitution gives the federal government specific limited powers for a reason, okay? Um, and uh, they push against that and have over, overcome those boundaries many times. And we could talk about all kinds of different ways they have. But in this particular case, um, a 
nationalized constitution, constitutional rights in education would put the Supreme Court of the United States as a national referee over every single state school system. Is that the kind of country we want to live in? I don't think so. And I think we can presume that when they say a child has a right to an education, they're not meaning they have a right to be homeschooled. They're meaning they have a right to public education. They're probably not even inferring that the child has a right to a private Christian school. <laughs> they, they are promoting a state-controlled educational system. Is that safe to assume that that's, that's no, the intent? I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure it's real. Not, I wouldn't assume that just yet. Um, clearly, this case was, was situated in the context of the Detroit public schools. And look, I'm sympathetic to these kids. I mean, I'm not saying that these kids said anything wrong. I mean, they, you know, they said, and it's probably true, that the schools were rodent infested, falling apart. You know, they, they sat in classrooms without teachers for hours at a time. I mean, it's Detroit. Detroit as a city has struggled with lots and lots of things. And, you know, I mean, it's, no, that doesn't excuse, you know, you know, this kind of treatment of children in, in the public schools. Um, and I can understand why these kids would want to maybe sue so that that, you know, other kids could get a better education. That, that's not the question. The question isn't whether the Detroit public schools are so bad that the, you know, the question is, what's the right way to deal with it? Is it the state or the federal role to deal with it? Uh, so anyway, but in the ruling, basically the judge said, look, there's a basic right to education and they narrowed it a little bit, a little bit. But, you know, when you put the camel's nose under the tent, the, the the head follows and then the hump fall you know and the tent falls down right okay so so uh, anyway they're starting with this right to literacy is mm. how he described it okay mm. it's like look you know at a minimum a basic right to education has to include literacy okay so they didn't get into you know whether it's private or not but I think you're right it would not be very difficult at all and in fact it probably is would be their intent that every form of education whether it's private or public would have to meet this new constitutional standard of literacy. And how are you gonna tell if people are literate? You've gotta give them a literacy test. There you go. And what's on the test? And at what age do children have to learn how to read? Right? And so you, all of a sudden, you, these questions immediately pop up, right? Right. And if there's a federal right to an education, whose responsibility is it to fulfill that right? Well, if it's a federal right, it's the federal government's responsibility, isn't it? So then the federal government has to create the standards and the standardized testing and so on. So yeah, I see what you're saying. It's like a Pandora box that uh, opens up an entirely new um, leverage for federal government to interfere on a state level. Uh, so, so I appreciate you. Now you have an article coming out about this. Is that correct? Yeah, there's an article that will be coming out, um, you know, hopefully soon in the next few days uh, somewhere. Um, I can't say where. Well, you probably post it on uh, HSLDA's website, right? A link to uh, it. Well, may, well, it might be posted somewhere else. I, okay. I can't say yet because, uh, okay. you know, when you, when you submit articles to, you know, people to publish and they haven't published it, who knows if they'll ever end up publishing it. So okay. I can't say just yet, but keep your eyes open. There'll be an article coming out. And if, if it doesn't get published by some other publication, HSLDA will certainly put it up on our website. Um, so in the next few days, there'll be something out there, which basically goes through what we just talked about sure. um, in a little bit more detail. So in closing here, let me just have you speak to any other important individuals or organizations that were part of this summit that you think are important for especially homeschoolers to be aware of. Uh, one group that comes to my mind is the Coalition for Responsible Home Education, CRHE, because that sounds like an organization that might be representing our interests. Uh, but but I um, would like you to speak to, you know, is that a group that um, is, is advocating for homeschooling? What's your take on uh, CRHE? Well, um, you know, CRHE is an interesting organization. Um, I don't know any of the people there very well personally. I've never met any of them that I recall. Um, and, and the name Coalition for Responsible Home Education sounds nice, right? And I think they you know, phrased it that way intentionally because they they don't want to necessarily be perceived as anti-homeschooling. And and they say on their website that they're not anti-homeschooling. 
Uh, but what they are is pro-regulation. They want to see more regulation put on homeschooling. That's their agenda. Um, and they have their reasons for it. And uh, I don't agree with their reasons. And uh, at HSLDA, we think that um, any regulations imposed on homeschooling should be reasonable. We don't think there's any place in the United States where there needs to be any additional regulation on homeschooling. There's no evidence to suggest that more regulation on homeschooling is going to help the kids who are homeschooled or the parents that are homeschooling or that it's going to make a difference in any of the you know, issues that these folks at CRHE are bringing up as, re as, as the reasons they feel that um, there should be more regulation. I mean, what they talk about is the risk of abuse. They say there's this risk of abuse, but they don't really have any empirical evidence to suggest that that's actually true. Um, and, you know, look, I don't doubt for a minute that any of the kids who are profiled on their website had problematic experiences. Um, or any people who are out there sharing their own experiences saying that they suffered from abuse or neglect or had a bad situation that they didn't like or didn't feel was good for them. I mean, look, that's their experience. Who am I to say that wasn't their experience? Um, I mean, some, 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 but when you get into the details, you know, we can look at whether or not that really was abuse or neglect. Cl clearly there is abuse all over the place. Um, and it happens sometimes in homeschools. Our experience at HSLDA is that that's very uh, unusual. It's very rare. Not that it doesn't happen, but when you compare it to the prevalence in other uh, schooling environments, I mean, look, I'm not gonna sit here and say that uh, abuse is rampant in public schools. Other people say that, <laughs> okay? Um, and so, and that doesn't mean that these people don't have a, a leg to stand on because look, abuse is abuse, right? No matter where it happens. And so, you know, you want to try to deal with it where you can. But when it comes to re recommending policy, public policy, you've got to have an empirical basis. You can't just say, well, I think therefore we should, right? That's not a good reason for making policy. Or you should say, well, look right over there. Look, there's a case. Look at the Turpins in California. You know, look at those people. They were homeschooling and, and they abused their kids and therefore everybody should have to have a fire marshal come into their house, which is what the Cal state of California recommended is one way to, to address this issue. And the homeschoolers in California rose up and said, no, we don't have fire marshals coming into our house two times a year. And, and that's a silly idea anyway, because that's not going to stop abuse or, or right. deal with abuse, even if there is abuse happening. Right. So, so we have to apply some common sense to these policy proposals. Um, and, 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 and so you've got CRHE, which was one of the main participants in this conference. You've got um, professors like Milton Gaither at Messiah College, who was going to go there, Robert Kunzman at the uh, Indi Indiana University, where Rachel Coleman, who is the executive director of the Coalition for Responsible Home Education, is also an instructor, I believe. And Rachel Coleman is the leader of CRHE. And uh, Kunzman, Robert Kunzman, the professor, is also at the same location. I think she, Ra Rachel was a student and now is a colleague of Professor Kunzman. Kunzman has written books about homeschooling. He has not said that he's anti-homeschooling. Gaither has not said they're anti has, that he is either, nor has Rachel Coleman. They say that they're for homeschooling, but they're for much more regulation or some more regulation on homeschooling. So those are the people who were invited to this conference. In order to go to the conference, to get a golden ticket to the conference, you had to at least be in favor of or w willing to support more regulation on homeschooling. No one uh, who was going to the conference that I'm aware of had any other viewpoint. I asked to go to the conference. I never got a response. Brian Ray said, hey, I'd like to go to the conference. Can I come? I'd like to come and participate. He was said, no, there's not enough room. Uh, there are other people who should have been invited who weren't. And look, Israel, I don't, I'm not, I don't want anybody to point the finger at me and say you're an anti-academic freedom, anti-free speech guy. I'm not. I have no problem with these people having a conference. I have conferences, and uh, I invite people that I want to invite. And they want to have a conference, they can invite people that they want to invite. That's fine. Um, and, you know, no problem. Free speech, academic freedom, freedom of assembly, support that. 
we need to have this debate. It's a good debate to have. And I'm, I'm glad that Professor Bartholet and Professor Dwyer were gonna have this conference and she wrote these articles because it has brought a lot of attention to this issue. And what it has shown is that there are a lot more people who are with us than against us. But that doesn't mean that we can be um, apathetic or lackadaisical about defending our freedom. This just shows that the enemies or the opponents of our freedom are there, they're working, and, and this, this shows to me that they're getting organized. So we need to be paying attention. Well, two resources that I wanna recommend at the end. I personally wrote an article, it's called Homeschooling and Abuse, that you can find if you Google search, Homeschooling and Abuse, Israel Wayne. Uh, it was published on homeschoolfreedom.com uh, for people that are listening and want an answer to this abuse issue. What about homeschooling and abuse and is additional regulation the answer to that? I think that article will be helpful for you. And then I want to mention the organization that you work for, Mike, HSLDA, because, you know, I was homeschooled in the 1980s, and in those days, HSLDA was seen as an essential organization, and membership was, uh, was a given. It was something that you realized you had to have uh, because the threat of the knock at the door was so impending with truancy officers and so forth as HSLDA has been effective in legalizing uh, homeschooling and creating a great culture of freedom in the United States, there are some homeschoolers who don't feel that membership in HSLDA is something that is important because they don't personally feel that they are at risk of having a knock on the door. What I would like to suggest is that the fight in homeschooling has transitioned over time from the doorstep to academia, the media, and the legislature and the courts. And that is where HSLDA is still really active and engaging and answering these things in sort of an apologetics approach of presenting research-based fact in uh, giving the common sense argument, you know, like how does taking resources away from a fire department or, or a health department, how, do, how does taking resources away from them to deal with real issues help stop abuse? Well, it, it doesn't. And so uh, HSLDA has, uh, has continued to work with legislatures. I'm the vice president of the Michigan Homeschool Association mission, M-I-C-H-N, and we work very closely with Mike Donnelly in particular and HSLDA, and Mike has been an invaluable resource for us in terms of dealing with legislative issues that come up uh, that oftentimes people in our state didn't know ever happened uh, because sometimes there's a bill that gets introduced in an education committee and we shoot off an email to Mike Donnelly. We say, what do you think of this? We talk about it. We come back together. We contact the chairs of our education house or Senate committees. And uh, because of relationships that our state organization has with those individuals, uh, we've been able to kill bills before they ever got out of committee. So we haven't had to, you know, have people go to the, the state, uh, state house. We haven't had to have them call their legislators. We've been able to shut down really bad bills that would have severely regulated homeschooling with the help of HSLDA. So uh, Mike works for HSLDA. And so I'm going to make the pitch myself because I don't personally work for HSLDA. Uh, I'm a lifetime member of HSLDA myself, but I've seen what they're doing in the legislator, legislature. I've seen what they're doing in the media and countering these uh, false allegations and, and this false narrative of, of this negative stereotype of homeschooling. And I am pleased that my membership with HSLDA is helping to fight for homeschooling freedom on a state basis on a national basis, and even on an international level. I've traveled internationally with Mike, and we've spoken at conferences around the world together, and I see how they are expanding homeschool freedoms around the globe, that people who didn't ever dare to dream or hope that they could homeschool legally in their country are now finding the opportunity to do that or working towards that. And that's because of your dollars that go into being a member of HSLDA. So all of us hope that we never need to have uh, that phone call because there's somebody at our doorstep, but the way to win the fight of homeschool freedom is not until they're on your doorstep. 
And that's exactly that's right. why we're talking about this today is because uh, they will be on the doorstep at some point in the future if the freedoms that we've gained have had a chance to, to roll back because we've just been negligent. And I don't know anyone who is more on the front lines of fighting and defending homeschool freedoms than HSLDA uh, and Mike Donnelly in particular. And so, uh, Mike, I just want to thank you for the work that you do. We need to pray for uh, Mike. We need to pray for the HSLDA staff, for their families. They are on the front lines, and the work that they do is so important. So, Mike, do you have any closing comments uh, for people as they just consider, you know, this issue? Obviously, we're not trying to fear monger. We're not trying to, you know, create panic. We're we don't feel like this summit with Harvard is, you know, the end of the world or anything like that. But we feel like it's important to be aware and to know that right. they're, they're recircling the wagons and they have the same ideologies. These are influential people. And these ideologies will come back in different ways and different forms in the future. You know, Israel, I'll just say this in closing. Um, the work that I do with Mission uh, and the folks in Michigan, uh, multiply that times 50. That's what HSLDA does. We do that same thing with the state organizations in every single state. And I work with organizations globally as well to encourage, to, to equip, uh, so that we work together as a team to advance homeschool freedom and to defend our freedom, okay? So that's what HSLDA does legislatively. We do a lot of different things. Um, and you know what you just said, I mean, thank you so much for your endorsement. We appreciate having you as a member and I invite other folks to be members to support us for exactly that reason. There are threats to freedom local, national, international, we have to work together as the homeschooling community, uh, all of us together, no matter what our religious beliefs are, no matter what our philosophical beliefs or political beliefs are, we have to work together to preserve this freedom because there's one thing that's more important, that there is one thing that's true. Between the parents and the government, parents are the ones who should be making the decision about how their children are educated, period. Okay, period, full stop. Okay, and that's what we're all about. Um, doesn't mean that there isn't a role for government. There certainly are appropriate roles for government. You can ask Israel and read his books. He does a great job of articulating that. But, you know, HSLDA is active in the states. Over the last three or four years, we have had numerous battles where there have been proposals that would put crazy regulations that we talked about before on homeschooling. Globally, there is a, there is a growing global homeschooling movement. And people are wanting something different. And at this time, 1.5 billion children in 190 countries are pretty much out of school and everybody is suddenly schooling at home. And that's why HSLDA created a website called mompossible.org to reach out to the public to help them, encourage them during this crazy time. And we hope, and I expect to see, that in the fall of this year, of 2020, we're gonna see a very significant increase in the homeschooling population, which means that you and others in your organizations and in your communities you're going to have an opportunity to reach out to your friends, to your neighbors, the folks you go to church with that you run into wherever and talk to them about homeschooling and help them understand what is homeschooling? What is the vision for homeschooling? Homeschooling is not school at home. Homeschooling is a completely different way of doing it. As you know, those of you who are homeschooled and we've got to preserve that freedom, that flexibility, that customization, that capacity that homeschooling has to treat children individual. Mike, that, oh, let, sorry, me just, let me just say this one more thing. No, yeah, it's, one, it's one more thing. I know that was a great pause right there, but I wanted people to savor that thought because that's yes. what homeschooling is about. It's yes. about treating each child as a unique individual with different learning styles, different learning needs, different interests. And that's what homeschooling allows. So I wanna encourage anybody who's listening to this, um, uh, you know, video, whether you're on the podcast or you're at the mission homeschool day at the dome, um, you know, what you're doing today in your home, in your legislature, in your capital matters. And we have to work together as state organizations, national organizations and advocates to preserve this freedom that we, we cherish. Amen. Well, you are uh, always welcome here on the podcast. And if there's an opportunity that we have to uh, discuss something that's relevant, uh, you can certainly feel free to contact me, but I will probably be contacting you. Uh, I expect that uh, we'll have many more opportunities to discuss issues that are relevant and important for, uh, for families and parental rights. So thank you for the work you do. God bless you. Thank you.